Um, I, I just highlighted how, for example, RNA and proteins have different half-life. Um, and so that uh, is, is, is noted here, um, this idea of response time and speed. So just backing up, you know, this is a diagram that shows uh, an example in E. coli where you can change the rate of transcription. So there's transcriptional control. Um, and then you can change your mRNA lifespan, but you can also do a lot more than that to change the translation rate. Um, and then you can, you can affect um, the, the protein post-translation. So this, this image from a textbook has this exercise to label the mode of regulation that is the slowest in response time and that which is fastest. When you think about it, if you have to go through the stages of transcription and translation to change how much enzyme is active, that adds a lot of time, uh, you know, just and steps to making an adjustment. And if you're a unicellular bacterium, uh, you know, you've probably evolved uh, some mechanisms to need to re respond to things really quickly in order to survive. And so post-translational control um, gives you that kind of response uh, speed. However, uh, in this exercise, also this idea of labeling the most efficient and least efficient in resource use. And you can also think that if you've already made all this enzyme just to turn it off or degrade it, that's really wasteful, right? So in terms of resources, it's really efficient to be able to just flip a switch and decide, I'm going to transcribe this gene. Um, then you haven't gone through all these wasteful processes. And so there's this trade-off inherent um, in, in nature, in natural and engineered processes too. Okay. When we think about the history of gene regulation, and uncovering it, um, you know, some people tend to start with Jacob and Minode's discovery of the lac operon, um, but really Barbara McClintock um, did pioneering studies of genes in corn. Um, you know, she's, she eventually won the Nobel Prize um, for the discovery of transposons. Um, transposons are jumping gene elements, um, and she observed as early as the 1950s that these elements seemed to have some way of controlling or regulating gene expression. Um, but of course, very little was still known at that time. I mean, we didn't even have the structure of the DNA double helix. Um, so there tends to be more detailed characterization and more emphasis on, on the experiments performed by Jacob and Minode around this LAC operon. Uh, if any of you have taken a biochemistry class or a genetics class, the lac operon tends to be emphasized a lot. I used to think it was just for historical value, but as I've now spent more time thinking about it as an instructor, I realize that the lac operon is really elegant and a, uh, a very good uh, educational example to focus on because it performs this logic that um, we can justify and, and get more into in a moment, uh, where cells, uh, the lac operon is about lactose utilization, and E. coli express the proteins involved in lactose metabolism only when lactose is around and when glucose isn't around. So that's two modes of sensing going on here and a logical operation that they're performing. Uh, you might ask, why not express these genes all the time? Uh, and so for that, we can go back to um, the bowtie perspective on metabolism and remind ourselves that even though organisms can, can take up so many different kinds of nutrients, uh, funneling these diverse carbon sources into central metabolism, not all of these pathways are equally efficient. Um, and in fact, uh, glucose for just about every cell type uh, that is capable of growing on it uh, is the preferred substrate when available, certainly for E. coli. And so what you've got in this LAC operon are two features around the promoter, and we've talked about promoters before. So here's your LAC operon of LAC genes Z, Y, A, 
uh, involved in the breakdown of, of lactose. Um, flanking the promoter, or you could say as part of it, um, is on the left, uh, a CAP site. And we can talk about this more generally as um, a cyclic AMP binding site or just related to catabolite repression and glucose recognition. Um, so this is what's saying, um, you know, uh, is glucose around? Um, and it has a positive interaction. We'll talk about what that means. Um, such that when it bind, when uh, effectively, uh, and, and so I want to try to slow down here and make sure I, I explain this. Um, when it binds, what's positive is when it binds, it helps recruit an RNA polymerase. Um, this is described as a negative interaction because when the repressor binds, the operator um, sequence, a DNA sequence, then the RNA polymerase is inhibited uh, from being able to transcribe these genes. So diving a little bit more into positive regulation and negative regulation before I go into catabolite repression. Um, so we're defining positive and negative as uh, when gene expression is increased by the presence of a specific regulatory element that's positive regulation because it increases gene expression. That element could be a protein or small molecule. Proteins that do this are typically um, called transcriptional activators. Okay, so negative regulation is just the opposite and a negative regulator is usually known as a repressor. Um, I'll pause for a moment here and ask if there are any questions, but I'm gonna spend more time on positive regulation, negative regulation, and the lack operon. Okay, I'll keep going. So here, um, we have just the illustration uh, to go along with the text before. Uh, again, here, something is bound, uh, and it's, we're, because transcription is occurring, it's a transcriptional activator. When it's not bound, this promoter is effectively not functional or, or off, at least in an off state. And so here's the illustration for negative regulation. Repressor binds, you got no transcription. Uh, no repressor, you get transcription. Now, this concept might seem really perhaps elementary to you, but the, a big part of the next two lectures is all about the getting into some very interesting transcription factor engineering um, for usually repressors, also activators. So you want to make sure that you you got this um, pretty clear. And so another way to represent this, which is different than the previous slide, and which I'll try to go through slowly, even though it might feel redundant, is thinking about it more from the small molecule perspective. Because this is really focused on what's positively regulating and negatively regulating at the protein level, transcription factor. And this is kind of talking about how that can relate to how metabolites and other small molecules can influence whether genes are turned on or not. Um, and so it's their binding of a transcriptional activator or regulator, uh, activator or repressor, um, that either causes association to DNA or disassociation. So uh, we can look at this again, kind of using a quadrant view, and we have a column for negative regulation column for positive regulation. Um, in case A, we've got a molecular signal that binds to a repressor, uh, and therefore, when the molecule binds to the repressor, we have the unbinding or disassociation from DNA, allowing RNA to be made. So that is uh, one way this could go. Another way this could go, oops, is that um, the small molecule actually makes the repressor bind the DNA. And so then that leads to a different outcome. That means from the perspective of the small molecule, when it's around, there's no RNA, no transcription. But when it's not present, then you get the unbinding and you get RNA. So in either case, A or B, um, because it's a repressor, you get RNA when it's unbound to DNA. 
when the repressor is unbound to DNA. But what's different in cases A and B is what role the small molecule is playing. And you see all of these cases in nature. So I won't spend as much time on the positive regulation case. But the same kind of deal is going on here. Um, you have, if, you're, if your small molecule causes your activator to disassociate, then when the small molecule is around, you're not going to be making RNA. But when it's not around, uh, you, you're, uh, when it's not around, in this case, you are making RNA. Uh, in the final example here, D, if your small molecule causes the activator to bind DNA, then when the small molecule is around, you make RNA. And so I'll pause again, because I think, you know, when I was putting this together, for example, at first I wondered, well, what's the difference between what this message is trying to convey and this example here? But this is much more about the role that the small molecule plays. And as metabolic engineers, I think we want to think very deeply uh, and, and understand that we're not just talking about transcriptional regulators and activators uh, in general. We're talking about how small molecules and metabolites can, can cause them to do different.